We're very fortunate today to have Dr. Janet Rankin with us. She is the senior co-director of uh, the Teaching and Learning Lab at MIT. She earned her bachelor's degree in engineering from Brown University and her PhD in material science and engineering from MIT. And since then, she has uh, played a number of different roles, uh, running programs, teaching, uh, doing all the things that faculty do at Brown University and at MIT. And uh, the Teaching and Learning Lab is just a valuable, valuable resource to MIT, helping us to stay connected with the best practices and how people learn and how best to both teach and how to assess. And uh, so we're very grateful to have it. And we thought it would be helpful to share some of that knowledge with you all, our Egyptian University partners. So without further delay, let me hand it over to Janet Rankin. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Dan. And it's great to see everyone. Um, as Dan, as I mentioned to some of you, I think most of you were here, but I am I'm running two monitors. So if you see part of my face, it's not that I'm looking uh, that you don't have my full attention. It's just it's split between two screens. Uh, I have posted a link in the chat. Uh, and if you came in, I, I don't know how fast people are coming in, but I'm just going to post it again um, because, yes, yeah, same link. Um, this is sort of our driver document. This is the document that basically if you get disconnected or, or you're not sure what to do, if you go to this document, you'll have all the information you need uh, either to get reconnected, it's got the link to the meeting, or um, to find out what activities we might be doing or to find the slides. Um, and also to find a link to a Slido. A Slido is sort of a back channel question and answer uh, application that, that you all can use to ask questions of me during, during, the, um, during the workshop. So if you, if you can open up that doc and somebody should let me know if for some reason it's not working uh, and you'll see uh, kind of some guidelines for the session there. Uh, and you'll also see that Slido link. So you might wanna go ahead, open that link and then it lets you post questions um, that you can either um, you can either post an original question or you can upvote. Uh, you can't downvote, I don't think, but you can upvote a question of some. And then Dan will be monitoring that during the. Um, you know, if there's some burning questions or some things that really I, sh I I need to stop and clarify before we move on. He'll bring those to my attention, and then at some point we'll just look at the things with the most upvotes. We'll definitely try to address, and then we'll work our way down the list. Um, sound okay? Great. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so just bear with me while we um, make this happen. And hold on a second. A minute. All right, everybody see my screen? Thumbs up if you see it. Excellent, thank you. All right, so uh, Dan had asked me to speak a little bit about some research-based practices and, and I put remote in context because that's probably all any of us can think about right now. So uh, some practices for remote teaching and learning um, that we've, we've implemented and are thinking about implementing here at MIT. I, the Slido link is here, but also um, we've already talked about that. So like most, like many campuses across the world, um, at some point we realized that we couldn't all be here anymore or on campus anymore. So for MIT, that was March, early March, 2020. And um, so there was a decision made and in the course of about two weeks, a little more, uh, about two weeks, basically we sent all the undergraduates home all the students went home, um, and we had we were at the in the position of trying to get roughly a thousand faculty and instructors. They weren't all teaching necessarily that semester, but um, around fifteen hundred undergraduate courses, so different subjects that students were taking. Fifteen, there were about fifteen hundred on the books last spring, um, and which amounted to around four thousand undergraduates. And we had to get everything ready to enable those students to learn um, within about two weeks. 
So most campuses experience similar things, but it was a daunting task. I mean, nobody was prepared for it. Nobody was, I mean, we were a little prepared for it, but, but it, was a, it, it was an incredible kind of thing to have to do. So we mobilized and we started out by trying to think, okay, well, what's important? You know, how, how are we gonna do this? We've got people with a whole spectrum of teaching interests, teaching um, the different types of courses they were teaching. And so um, I think for the most part, we started out with this idea that, oh, synchronous teaching, we gotta be there. We all have to be in the same place. We have to um, all be listening at the same time. Um, so Zoom, everybody wanted Zoom. And if you own stock in Zoom, uh, sometime in, in February or maybe or a little bit earlier, you're probably in very good shape right now. So um, everybody went to Zoom um, and we thought this was going to do it. We were just going to have the same kinds of things we did in person. We're going to manage to do those synchronous uh, um, through digital means uh, and uh, everything would be okay. And we were really looking to sort of replicate or just make a model of that in-person experience. So there's some dot, dot, dots there, but, uh, but I will, um, you'll see, you probably know where I'm going with this, I think. Oops, did I skip one? So what actually happened during the semester? And for those of you, actually, I, many of you have either uh, no pictures up or just, um, or your, your name or just your face. But if you can turn on your video uh, for just a moment, and let me know if you were teaching this semester, um, what did you, you know, what did you experience? Think for a moment about what you experienced. You don't necessarily have to share it, but um, if you want to look at this list, are there anything you might want to add to that list about what you found happened? Like what, what you experienced, what students experienced? And if you and if you want to put that up in the chat, that that would be great. So there's some there's some wonderful I mean they're not wonderful they're <laughs> they're unfortunate but they're but they're complete they, all your responses resonate with me completely um, what you've added to the chat I hope folks are looking um, okay I'll give another maybe thirty seconds if anybody wants to add anything. <laughs> So, right. So I think, um, right. The transition was really bumpy. I mean, we, we kind of jumped into this, um, which made it, you know, we kind of were like, all right, I got to do it. And then it was really a little bit glitchy, right? Oh no, my, you know, my, I forgot to turn my microphone on and I've been talking for the past five minutes and nobody said anything. I mean, there were a lot of little glitches that, that people ran into. Um, the bandwidth, the connect connectivity issues with students, um, with, um, with faculty uh, were really, really challenging. And I think nobody really uh, had really, we had no way to engage with that problem until, until it hit us in the face. Um, I see, um, uh, so uh, Zoom etiquette, like what you do, do you have your camera on? Is it okay if we can see your bed in the background? Is it okay if, you know, your, your pets walk through the screen? Um, when do you ask a question? How do you ask a question? Can you cut the instructor off? Um, there were all these things that we just couldn't anticipate. But we had no way to anticipate these things until, until we experienced them. Um, Dan points out that MIT, MIT changed the grading system in the middle of it, which um, you, know, you can see why we might have needed to or wanted to, but it, it, it was just another curveball. It was just another kind of something came at us that we just weren't, ex 
may not have been prepared for or not expecting. And so then there's some wonderful, um, uh, there's a few examples of things that worked really well, and we'll talk about that as well, and maybe you'll have the opportunity to share that out verbally. Um, there's a really interesting story that I, it, it's in a book called Avatars of the Word, and um, it's written by uh, Robert O'Donnell, who used to be the provost at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, he talks about the, um, like, the, the idea that when there was um, early radio, so radio programs where people would, you know, this is in the, the 20s or the even earlier maybe, and people would listen to stories on the radio. Mm -hmm. And so they would have, they would have, you know, people would, there would be sound effects, you know, the horses were coming or the wind was blowing and they'd have sound and people would talk in different voices and, and tell a story and people listened to that. So when TV came along, somebody invented TV, right? So, you know, we're scientists, engineers, like, okay, TV. But when people thought about programming for, the, for, t for television shows, the only model they had was radio shows. So the first TV shows were people standing around a microphone. There was like a microphone, which is exactly what they did in the radio studio. And they would stand around the microphone and they would tell the story just as if there weren't a camera, but they would film this. And then somebody got this great idea to like have people dress up. Right. So they would put on different hats or they had they they wore different clothes, depending on what the story was. Um, but but really all they were doing was like was video recording a radio show. And so our ability to see beyond like to, to actually exploit the medium, to actually take advantage of some of the things is really limited until we get in the middle of it, until we get in the thick of it. Um, and so, you know, that happened. I'm sure we can think about how that happened with. Um, with uh, early technology, et cetera. Um, early, you know, when we had web, when we first had course websites, what we put on those websites. Um, and, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. It gives, it cuts us a little bit of slack, right? It cuts us this, it gives us this sense that, okay, we had to do this. We had to make these mistakes. We had to experience some amount of this pain um, in order to be able to do it better next time. So that's just a, um, uh, a thought I'd like to kind of pin. Uh, so some of these things, um, this idea of Zoom fatigue, uh, just hour after hour on Zoom meetings, um, the, this idea of community, right? Students wanted to study with other students, right? It, it's not that they wanted to just do weird, terrible things with other students. They just wanted to study with them. They wanted to find that academic community. And that's a really hard thing to do if you're not in the same place. Um, they wanted to connect with faculty in a better way. It's really hard to connect through these little boxes. Um, we've mentioned the um, bandwidth constraints. And then also here for us, we have many, and probably for you as well, we have these, we have international students. We have students from all parts of the United States that has, you know, three hours time zone three plus hours time zone differences. Um, and um, so that was really hard as well. And these again were things that we didn't necessarily think of until they hit us in the face. Um, and so I've alluded to this a little bit, like how were we so, how did we so get, how did we get so caught off guard, right? Or how did we get so, um, and I think it's, it's really well explained by this model by uh, Ruben Puente Dura or a theory about, it's called the SAMR model, S-A-M-R. And it is this idea that for any, really any change, but he wrote it with respect to technology, any adoption of technology, we go through these phases, this sort of where it becomes a substitute for something we already did, a pure substitute. So I'm video recording a radio show, right? That's a, just a substitute. Um, and then we go through these additional stages, like how do we, how do we augment it? How do we modify it so that it becomes a little bit better? And how do we redefine it? And it's this idea that that's what we started to do at MIT. That's what we started to do together collectively, faculty, instructors, folks from open learning, um, folks from my office, the teaching and learning lab. We started to think about how to go beyond the substitution. So if I was going to give a 60 minute lecture in a, uh, in a class um, and I was going to talk at the students for 60 minutes straight, which is not a great idea anyway. Um, but if I was going to do that, then Zoom is a, a, a synchronous, fully synchronous 60-minute Zoom presentation is, is a complete substitution. 
and it's not really doing anybody any good. Uh, it seems to have lost my video here, that's okay. Um, so this is an interesting model and, I, and, and I'm gonna show you a few examples of what MIT faculty have done and are going to continue to do in order to, um, to go beyond this, um, to go beyond pure substitution into the field, into the realm of augmentation, modification, and redefinition. Uh, Dan, is there anything in the chat I need, in the uh, Slido I need to know about? No, not yet. Okay, great. Okay, feel free, folks. So, so what did we learn? Um, and again, I, you know, the idea that hindsight is twenty twenty, right? That, that we can look back on this now and say, well, of course, but but anyway. Um, so we learned that um, that at asynchronous and synchronous, a combination of asynchronous and synchronous activities is crucial, right? We've learned that that's that's um, that's so so important. Um, we've learned that community is crucial. We have to have, we really have to give opportunities for students to, um, to build community. We're social beings and we learn in a social context. And if we take away that element, it really, it really degrades learning. It really compromises learning. Um, and that it's, it's, it's okay to admit that engaging students in a remote, um, remote learning in a remote environment is challenging. Um, for some of us, the subject matter is just, it, it totally precludes, um, it precludes that kind of interaction. So if you're teaching something that's, that's just completely hands-on, um, maybe that's harder to do uh, in a remote environment. But even that, we're coming up with ways, Dan, Dan himself is coming up with ways to, to kind of circumvent that challenge. How do we, how do we give students authentic experiences given that we're not in the same place physically so uh, we need to acknowledge that so that we can um, so that we can move on uh, I had asked Robert to circulate um, uh, a web link to some some stories some vignettes on the open learning open learnings uh, web page, website and I'm gonna I'm gonna try open that page there now um, just to refresh your, your memory or your, and I don't know if that's a good size for folks. And obviously I'm not going to read these, but there are on, they're fifth, on the order of 15, 14 or 15 um, vignettes from MIT faculty who, who, who actually started to go beyond that substitution. They went into the realm of augmentation. They went into the realm of modification and even in some cases redefinition of the experience. And I don't know if folks have had a chance <clears throat> had a chance to look over this list. These are just like one page stories if you haven't gotten a chance to. And again, they're, they're, they'll be avail available um, from the slides. Hopefully uh, we can make those hot links in the PDF so that everybody can still access the links. Um, does anybody have any uh, comments or thoughts or ideas, Some one of the particular cases you wanted to comment on or point out? And I think the group is not so big. Um, so if you want to just unmute yourself and jump in, that would be fine. I wanted to comment that I, I feel like Larry Sass is a real national treasure. Uh, if you're trying to keep hands on going, even in a remote environment, some of the things he's doing with rapid prototyping at, at, at a bigger scale, uh, could could really catch on. Mm -hmm. That's great. So if folks are interested in that and you haven't yet um, read Larry's story, um, I encourage you to do so. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else have any, um, any of, want to comment on any of the vignettes? <laughs> yes, please, for me. Hi, <laughs> I just Ellie. want to add, uh, hi, how are you doing? I just want to add uh, the impact of the culture at the same time, because in Egypt we are more verbal and we um, rely more on the uh, body language. So uh, what I faced during uh, the online teaching, especially Zoom, is I don't feel satisfied while I'm uh, providing a lecture. And I saw in your uh, previous slide that community is important. Uh, so when I start um, uh, discussing this issue with my colleagues at the faculty here, uh, some of them are um, 
completely uh, accepting the idea of having online teaching even for the rest of uh, the, the education period. Uh, but mm -hmm. for me, I am emphasizing that I need a human reaction and interaction between me and the student to get involved in the educational uh, process. Uh, am I mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as you said, it, different people have different styles and different um, different ways of, of, of connecting with students. Um, but I, I, I will not argue that for some people really that that physical physical um, connection is is just very, very important. Um, I think there's this idea, you know, this there's a saying, there's lots of variants of it, but this idea of don't let the perfect stand in the way of the possible. Um, and so I think that, you know, if, if, for the moment, we have to come up with ways to make it a little bit better. And I'll show you an example in just a moment. Um, so how do we, we can't be in the same space with people for the most part, at least we can't here. Um, and what can we do that gets us just a little bit closer? And so I think there are broader uh, institutional policy discussions that have to get made to say, oh, well, okay, this part, it's really cheap if we go totally remote, or it's, we can save a lot of money if we do this, that, or the other thing. Um, but those conversations about the importance of being in the same physical space obviously need to inform those decisions for sure. Yeah, and that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Now, I just wanted to follow up on this comment uh, by Dr. Khatam, <clears throat> um, that there has been a lot of emphasis recently on uh, hands-on classes, <clears throat> experimental courses, workshops, and how to do them online. People are forgetting that it is as challenging teaching analytical concepts and abstraction online as it is with hands-on. Um, it, 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 it's a kind of imparting this on the deep understanding of subtle analytical concepts. Mm -hmm. While you're in the classroom, using your hands and your body and your head and staring people in the eyes and trying to see whether they've got the entropy or not, and mm -hmm. then responding and iterating is an experience that's very difficult uh, to uh, do online and takes a lot more um, exercises before I found that I had to talk with my TA online before the class last mm. spring on some of these concepts and see how he responded before I gave the lecture. Yeah. Um, and still, even in the lecture, I was having a hard time seeing <clears throat> whether enough or should I go on or should I repeat <clears throat> or mm -hmm. should I use different gestures and, and, and uh, sort of move between Blackboard and other places. So I just wanted to bring that point up because it is, it, 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 it's sort of lost in the, in the noise that analytical classes, especially large analytic uh, uh, classes, um, are as difficult to teach online as hands-on. I mean, yes. I think, oh. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, sorry if I'm interrupting, but exactly this is what happened with me. I started with a recorded videos, like uh, not videos, it's a PowerPoint recording uh, mm -hmm. sessions. And Voice then I said to the students, I didn't feel satisfied. And then I start recording and send, sending to the students, I didn't feel satisfied. And then I started with a um, user, uh, then I followed it up by using an iPad with the pencil, I didn't feel satisfied as well. So at the end, I, I bought a small white paper, so small white board, okay, and I start writing on it. It was very, very small. Again, this is not satisfying for me. Finally, I bought a board, white board, it's one and a half meter by 70 centimeters. And at that time, I was standing and writing as if I'm in the class. And at that point, I felt it's okay for me. <laughs> Let us start. So I'm not sure. <laughs> I felt at that time I'm not uh, well at using media, but this is not the case. It's not about the media. It's about how can I deliver the information and being satisfied at the same time. 
Right. I mean, I, and I totally agree. And we have, there's so many variables and there's so many, it's, it's what you're trying to teach. It's how you, you're used to teaching it. Um, and then it's just this constraint of, of, you know, it, we can't do exactly what we did before. Um, I do think that, you know, there are, is an opportunity and we're doing this with a class we teach. I, I'm doing it with a class that I teach in the, in the fall saying well, how much of this, you know, I, I, I used to deliver a certain amount of content. I stood in front of the class and I would deliver content. I, it was like a one-way communication. And how much of that do they need to actually hear from me in situ? If I'm doing, if we're doing something that's really um, nuanced and really a, a bit complex and a bit um, where there's going to be a bit of back and forth and I know there's going to be a lot of questions, well then, yeah, we need to be in the same place and we need to be able to puzzle through that together. Um, but if we're trying to do something where it really is a delivery, then maybe we start to think about how we offload that, how we can offload that content delivery to another medium where we can, we can, um, we can allow students to read it on their own time, view it on their own time or whatever. But, but there's so many, so many variables. Um, and I think this is part of it is we do have to play around with it. We have to live with this for a while. Exactly what you said, Valit, that we have to, um, you know, we have to say, well, that's not working. Let me try this. That's not working. I mean, we have to be experimentalists at a certain level, but it should be grounded on, the, on some principles that we know about best practices of learning, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Khatam, I should add that um, <clears throat> your experience moving from kind of sitting down and, and, and writing on boards into uh, having a stand-up uh, model uh, uh, has been confirmed by several others here in some of the workshops I attended recently. <clears throat> I heard from people who had been doing online teaching for a while that many of them have moved into the mode of getting a whiteboard and setting it up in their basement <clears throat> and putting a curtain around it and recording uh, their teaching while they're standing up on the board and, and kind of gesturing and moving around. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and, and they found that much more effective both on their side as kind of the, the passion that we have as teachers standing up and moving around and so on gets better uh, uh, projected as well as from the student response. So I'm actually looking for, for one of these small scale magic boards um, that, that have also become popular. Um, if I find one at the right price, I'll let you know about it. Yes, please. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for, for all of your contributions there. And I think, um, you know, viewing some of the examples that I show through this lens, uh, through the lens of what worked for me, what do I think will work for me, what do I need, um, can, can be very help, helpful as well. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I do have a few, just a few recordings. I think I'm going to just do two of these. Um, and one is from a chemistry class. Again, this is, it was a large chemistry class, a very big uh, intro class. <laughs> and this instructor talks about um, how, they, um, how they connected with students. So I'm just going to play that video. And Somebody tell me if you can't hear it. So just bear with me for a moment. And unfortunately, this is, I'll, I'll make it bigger in a second. You really just need to hear the audio. The third I miss my students, and I think the, the some sort of aspect where um, we can all meet together at a, as a community is really important um, to keep that, that sense of accountability going. So um, he talks about just mechanisms for facilitating how students can work, can get together and work in a community. Um, and then this is another aspect about really trying to, you know, trying to connect with the students, even if you can't be in the physical space. So this faculty member is from Sloan, and um, this is a bit longer, this video. and I do Zoom lunches. I initially was doing in-person lunches on campus where up to eight students can sign up for a lunch. I went to twice a week because remarkably there was more demand. And I think I will cover of the students I'm honored to teach, I will probably cover about 40% of the students over these uh, six weeks will have and will continue to sign up. 
and they're very lighthearted, but they're also an opportunity to engage uh, with the students outside of the classroom. So, um, so that's kind of an interesting model where he just set aside some time. And if the students wanted to meet with him, it wasn't really an, it wasn't an academic exercise, but it was an it was it gave the students an opportunity to just be in the same place with the instructor and get to know um, him a little bit more. Uh, again, build some connections, uh, maybe talk about some things that weren't ac academic. Um, and he found that to be really, really successful. Um, so uh, one, I'm, I'm not going to show a clip, but in global languages, this is one of the vignettes. Um, and, and I think this is a great example of, of going to sort of aug augmentation and maybe even modification. So they were teaching um, um, uh, Russian, Russian language, and they were able to uh, pair students up with students in Russia um, so that they could have Zoom conversations about, um, you know, just about how the pandemic was affecting their lives, but they discussed it in Russian. So that's something that they maybe wouldn't have thought to do if, the, if we hadn't been in the middle of a pandemic and we hadn't been forced to be remote, the conversations would be happening in the class. But you can think about that, that, that the connections that those students were able to build with students that in, in, a complete, in, in Russia wh where, um, where they really got to have kind of meaningful, authentic conversations using the language that they were trying to learn. So um, that's an example from there. Sorry. Um, and I will show you, we have a little bit of time, um, one more clip, and this was, so what we know from how people learn is this, the importance of frequent assessments with immediate and targeted feedback. We know for learning, you know, if you've ever tried to learn anything, if you try to learn something in a vacuum, you get or by yourself and you get a little confused and nobody sets you straight, nobody gives you the, the feedback that you need at that point, the, that misconception or that misunderstanding just propagates. It continues to move. It, conti it follows you through um, subsequent learning. Um, so if you can have, if we, if you use frequent, um, frequent assessments, frequent assignments that have that targeted feedback, the students get the information when they're still confused and they still remember why they're confused. Um, that that really sets the stage for this sort of um, expansion of student understanding or to, to promote further learning. And, um, and so um, there's an interesting uh, discussion by uh, two instructors in, in our intro physics class. This is actually the electricity and magnetism class um, where they talk about students' perception of frequent assignments and actually um, what they um, kind of, how they really, well, you'll see, they'll tell the story. One of the things that stood out to me, the 70-30 split or something, people saying it was the right number of due dates versus too many, but all of the comments that people left were things like, I hated having so many due dates, but I guess it kept me on track, um, and, which is why they, they ended up saying it was the right number. But I actually think, um, I'm hopeful that this coming fall is going to be a little different. I mean, we're going to keep the, the same due dates, as Peter said, but um, instead of using uh, Stellar, we're going to use Canvas, and we're still using MITx, so all of our assignments will still be on MITx, but we're going to have all of our due dates listed on Canvas, and so I think it will actually be a lot easier for students to keep track of all those due dates, because that was actually, I think, the biggest complaint, the students saying they could not keep track of all the due dates, and I think the, the move to Canvas is going to be really advantageous for students being able to keep track of all the various due dates for all the different classes. So in that example, you can see that the students, there was a little bit of tension, right, between them thinking they had so many due dates, but then also realizing that that's exactly what they needed to learn uh, more robustly. Um, and Canvas is our learning management system that we're just starting to adopt. It's a new learning management system that we're um, using at MIT. I don't know what you, you all are using, but it does do a better job of integrating all the information in one place, which is really, you can imagine it's really important. Many of you had trouble finding the, um, this meeting today. And you can imagine if a student's taking five classes or six classes and, and they've got different Zoom links for every meeting, um, uh, having all that information like right somewhere central where they can just click on it and they know they'll go to the right class, um, is it really lowers the barrier. It takes away some of the, um, the sort of uh, 
bandwidth issue, cognitive bandwidth issues that students have in terms of like getting to the right place to, for learning. Um, one more, one more, um, is there a question? Sorry. Quick question, Janet. Do, do you think that Cambridge University with, you know, high stakes annual assessment is off the mark or are they doing something with tutorial to ensure keep, you know, students are staying on track? Well, that's a great question, Dan. I mean, certainly high stakes assessment, I'm not a serious fan of it, right? I mean, it's a snapshot of one of a student's learning experience and it puts, I mean, I think the, the stress that it puts on students, um, you know, I can't say that, it, I think students who do well on it are probably well qualified. I mean, that I'm not, I don't argue that, but I think you're missing students who maybe are just not the kind of people that can take these high stakes tests. And, and obviously if you're, if you're, if you're training something to be someone to be an air traffic controller or, you know, uh, the core of a nuclear, operate a nuclear reactor or something, maybe you want to make sure that they can work under stress, like high super stress conditions. But for most of us, we're, we're not, our jobs are not predicated on us being able to like do something crazy high stress. I mean, brain surgeons and all those kinds of things, but for the most part, it's not. So I'm not sure we're getting the best mix of people by putting all our eggs in a high stress, the high stress basket. Um, the tutorial system, on the other hand, is fabulous. I mean, I don't think you can ask for a better way for people to learn, right? I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect because it does exactly what, um, you know, exactly what we know they need. They do something, the tutor's an expert, the tutor says, um, okay, this isn't right. You know, it walks them through it. Why do you think it's wrong? Here, let's try it a different way. They can tailor the learning experiences to fit the needs of the learner. Um, so it's a wonderful experience. It, it doesn't scale too well, but, um, but and that's, the, that's what, um, you know, we could have a whole nother 50 minutes talking about, um, about research-based practices, active learning, right? That in many, in many cases, in, in many, time, many times, uh, these sort of lower stakes formative assessments like active learning activities, quick clicker questions, breakout room discussions, those things are at some level of formative assessment, but they are, they're, they're doing a pretty good job of scaling this idea of a tutorial experience, right? Because if a student goes into a breakout room and then the people in the breakout room are completely confused, they can get help for their problem, right? Or you can, you can drop into the breakout room and say, oh, you know what? you're messing this up because you forgot about this factor, of, you know, you forgot about pi or something, or did you look at the units? Um, so you can give that targeted feedback right away in a way it does and it does let you scale. It's certainly not like we had thousands of tutors, right? But um, it does let you give tutor-like feedback in a large, in a large scale um, system. So I didn't answer your question, Dan. I, I'm not a fan of high stakes assessment in general, but the tutorial experience is great and obviously they get some fabulous people through that system but i think they do miss people that have um that have wonderful skills and abilities and are would be great to have in certain fields but they don't they don't excel in that system um i did want to give you all a chance to talk in breakout rooms we have about maybe about 10 10 ish minutes so um you have if you've opened your google doc the, the Google Doc, does everybody have access to that? I'm gonna paste that in the chat again. I don't know if anybody came in late. Um, and if you go to the Google Doc, there's a, a place for the um, activity. And uh, Robert is momentarily is gonna put you all in breakout rooms. We'll see how many people end up in each room. And then I'd just like you to discuss um, you know, what you're gonna do in the fall, if you're teaching in the fall, what are you going to do differently? What are you going to do the same? Are you going to, did you read anything in term, on the um, open learning site or did any of the things that happened in the videos or that we've talked about today? Did it give you some ideas? Um, what are you going to try to do? Uh, why are you going to do it? What do you think is going to help? What resources are you going to need? Do you need to start preparing now? Um, don't even try to get a camera for your commute, I tried. There's everything is sold out. Like they're sold out all over the world. Um, but uh, what are you going to need? What resources are you going to need? And then, do you do you anticipate any problems? So just take some quick notes in the in that document, and um, and uh, I will be popping into the various rooms 
uh, to see how you're all doing. Uh, I'm going to try to call you back in about, I think, if, could I call everybody back in 10 minutes and then, and then wrap up quickly? Would that be okay? I'll end by 11. But Okay, so t about 10 minutes in the breakout rooms. And, and you can write directly into that, on in, in that document. Okay? Great? All right. See you. Everyone's been invited to the breakout room, so please uh, move to them as quickly as possible. Hi, Sarah, Tamara, Ahmed, nice to meet you. I don't know if you all can put your cameras on or not. It's a lot easier. It's a lot nicer to see people. Um, you know, can you all hear me? Uh, uh, Janet, I don't think yeah. you're in your breakout room. Um, I am. I'm in breakout room three. I'm looking oh, at um, I just need to Ahmed. Video, Dina, and that I'll solve the problem momentarily. Um, okay. Actually. Um, I was actually thinking I don't need to be in a breakout room just because I, I might want to just move around. Can I, can I move okay. around? Oh, I'm not the host, though. I'll, I'll just stay here. That's fine. I'll just stay here. Uh, you are a co-host, Janet. Oh, I am. Okay, so maybe I can, um, I would actually like to be able to um, leave the room and then... Um, hmm. Janet, if you leave the room, I can unpin your video, and then uh, we won't all hear you when you go between the rooms. Oh, shoot. Okay. Am I out? Uh, you are. Just give me one moment. I might actually be in two different rooms, too, but because I'm in twice, but I don't know. If it's smart enough to know. Uh, it should work now. Okay. Let me see. Um, let me have to take my slides down here. Um, let me see. Okay. No one. It's okay. I assume folks are talking in the breakout room, so. Um, no. I I realized by me giving you host I. I no longer have any control over the breakout room, so you may need to make me the host again. Okay, I have to, this is, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I can join a breakout room. I'm not sure who's the host, though. That's the problem. Um, I think you are, and if in the gallery view, you click on my image, you can make me the host again. All right, hi, non-participants. Are you in gallery view? I'm in gallery view, yeah. I, I, the confusion here is and you that see I'm in twice, right? I'm right. in, um, and I think one of them, so I can close the rooms. Well, maybe if I go into the chat, no, not the chat, participants list, maybe I can do it. Um, or if you're in gallery view, you should be Oh, here, to... I'm gonna make you the host there. Oh. I can, I went, yeah, okay, done. All right, that's nice. fine. Thank you. And now I have to figure out which camera to shut off. <laughs> this is a little confusing. Um, stop the video. It looks like they're about to come out. Did you give them 10 minutes? No, I it defaulted to five and I you said 10 afterwards. I, I see, sorry. I kept them open. I 
don't need to be host again. It's, it's fine. I'm going to just check the Slido and see if anybody's asked any questions. Okay. Interesting. Um, are you there, Robert? I am. Um, it's, it's interesting. So nobody asked any <laughs> questions in the Slido, but. Um, yeah, I think they're, it. I think it's probably because they're un, maybe unfamiliar with the tools. So possibly that's why. <laughs> that's fine. We, we've been doing workshops this past week, last week and this week. And, um, and we used the Slido and um, we had so many, I mean, they were just scrolling through, scrolling, like it was hard really? to keep track of them. Yeah, yeah. So it might just be what people are used to. Um, <laughs> but we did, they did ask some questions during the... Um, they, they inserted them in the chat box earlier. Right, right. So were there three breakout rooms or two? Uh, four. Four. So it looks like breakout room one and breakout room two are writing in the doc, but breakout room three and four aren't writing anything. <laughs> I don't know. So I might, um, oops. If you're ready, I'll run the breakout rooms. We can't hear you, Janet. I was getting a little bit of reverb, so I um, turned one of them off, but that works. That works. If you're ready, I'll, I'll close the breakout that, Great, that's fine. We all back? Um, so welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you were able to talk to each other. I was in one breakout room temporarily and it seemed like maybe there wasn't uh, communication, but hopefully you all figured that out. Um, so that's great. What I wanna do is share my screen real quickly just to show you the, this, this driver doc that we have. And some of you did actually um, uh, contribute to it. So you're, are you all seeing the document now? Yes? Thumbs up if you can see it, or give me a wave if you can see it. Can you see my document? I can see it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, this is this sort of driver document that has a lot of the act things, a lot of the information you need for the workshop in it. And we've been using this in, for all of the classes that we've been teaching online, this idea of having the information in one place. But you can see here the breakout room one has written a few things or one thing about um, about uh, the use of flipped classroom and student peer review 
which is a great, um, which is a great technique. Again, it, it saves you a little bit of grading and it also lets students connect with each other over and over a course related um, topic or activity. And it gives people a different way to show, demonstrate their understanding and help others learn. So that's fabulous. It's a great thing because it's not particularly research, uh, resource intensive. So that's wonderful. Um, Breakout Room 2 is going to use some recordings and some Zoom meetings. And, um, you know, as, as we talked a little bit about that inter, interspersing, you know, use a recording to deliver material, make sure that it's not too long of a recording, segment it up in a way that's, um, that's easy for students to, to, to digest and to check their understanding as they go through, and then have those Zoom meetings for that, for that expertise so that you can share your expertise and clarify misconceptions. Um, uh, some editing software, yep, exactly. And it's great to start to think about, um, about that now um, before, you know, a week before the semester starts. Um, experiments remotely, yes, they will be a challenge. There's a couple of stories on, on that on the Open Learning webpage about people who have taken hands-on learning experiences and gone remotely, and, and Dan, Dan has some experience with that, with that as well. So, um, so there's, some, there's getting to be a bigger and bigger database of, um, of information about how to go about doing that. Uh, breakout Room 3, um, the lunchtime engagement, again, that, that's a really easy thing to do, right? Because, you know, you don't have to buy anybody lunch, right? It's just, you just sit there with your lunch and, and they sit there with theirs and, and you know, you can, you can really build community pretty effectively and, and, and inexpensively that way. Um, yes, using, figuring out those extra features in Zoom or those third party applications that will interface with Zoom. Um, again, it's a great way to try to get students interacting or to get students making sure they're following and using the polling option. Um, so, so exploring Zoom and Zoom has some wonderful tutorials on their own site about you know, how, to use it, how to use it, how to use different features from it. And breakout room three, uh, four didn't add anything, but hopefully you had a good discussion. Um, so I'm, it's three minutes before the hour and I'm guessing you have something, oh, there we go. Um, hoping you have, um, I'm guessing you have something at 11 o'clock, but um, I hope this was a little bit helpful. At least gave you a few things to think about. Um, uh, very large classes. Yes, uh, I just saw something in the chat, in the document there, that uh, we have to be really premeditated about that. But, but again, the chemistry class was a large class. The physics class was a large class. Um, what, one thing we're thinking of here is building a, a kind of a virtual student center where students can go in virtually, and they can say, oh, this is the chemistry section. I'm gonna go in there and see what people are talking about with respect to chemistry. This is the physics section, um, or this is a particular class. This is the electricity and magnetism section. Um, and students can go in there virtually and find other students who are, are working on similar problems, working on homework. Um, and there might even be TAs or instructors in that space in at given times. And then maybe also in, within that virtual space, the idea of, okay, here it is, if you just want to sit and chat and talk about, um, you know, talk about whatever, uh, some, some non-academic topic. Um, so that's a way, even in a large class, you could, you could start to build community. And some of these interactive techniques that you have with Zoom, the breakout rooms, can make larger classes feel a little bit smaller. So I'm going to stop because I know we all have things to do. Um, I don't know if there's, there weren't any questions in Slido when I looked. Um, Dan, do you have anything you want to, anything we should not skip over? Or? No, no, I think you covered it really well. And I think the breakout practice was really useful. And I want to thank you very much. Uh, we do have some presentations we want to make from yeah. the partner universities, all three of them. So just thank you again. Thank you, thank you all. And uh, I wish you the best of luck in the fall. And um, hopefully we won't have to be doing that this much longer. But <laughs> fingers crossed. Yes, okay. Fingers crossed. Take, Take care, care all. Thank you, Janet. Bye-bye. So Professor Walid, I would like to uh, hand the baton to you uh, to coordinate these presentations by the Egyptian partner universities. Okay, sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, today we are going to have three presentations. 
uh, one from Ain Shams University and one from Aswan University and one from uh, Mansoura University. And I hope uh, each presenter will um, provide or deliver his presentation in 10 minutes as we discussed. Uh, the first presentation will be uh, by uh, Professor uh, Ali al Bahrawi. Uh, professor Ali is uh, a professor of uh, water resource management and he executed many national and international projects with organizations uh, from different countries, uh, Egypt, Canada, US, uh, Germany, Sweden. He worked with the World Bank, uh, Nile Basin, and the EU as well. His uh, expertise uh, is in many directions, especially in the research and teaching and training uh, of uh, the areas of uh, water resources, uh, hydro uh, politics, and computer modeling. Uh, operation research, soft skills, and intellectual communication. He is a um, very, very helpful uh, professor, and instructor, and the idol model in our uh, TSDC center uh, at Ain Shams University. So please, Dr. Ali, uh, if you can uh, deliver your presentation in 10 minutes, and if you can uh, provide your insight from the Egyptian side, or the Egyptian environment, it will be great. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sharing now my, my screen. Can you can you see my screen now? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, when I, I thought, what should I talk about? I, I found a very interesting resource that I used to prepare my presentation that is derived from numerous research on very important subjects um, uh, in cognitive science where people study the brain and the mental space used for thinking. Uh, they are watching master teachers who has highest achievements, what they do, what they don't do. And also they study from the cognitive part of things, how to give cognitive support to students to, to be able to learn complex tasks. Uh, I really like this, uh, these 10 research-based principles, and I listed them in this uh, slide, and I will go one by one. I will try to abide by the time limit. First, uh, principle is to begin a class with a short review of, of previous learning. And this is done to strengthen the connection among the material we have learned, and Teachers has to ask students about points where they have difficulties or made errors. And uh, they can also review materials that needs overlearning. I, I love this uh, expression. Most of the expressions I love, I underline. And, and what I mean by overlearning is to practice beyond the point of material mastery, leading to something called um, automatic automaticity. Automaticity where, where, where students can 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 uh, act automatically. They don't need time to, to recall. The second is to present new uh, material. Me, Professor uh, uh, Ali, uh, yeah. can, you, uh, can you put the presentation in the presentation mode? Okay, I will do that. It will make, be, it, will make it a bit bigger. Is it visible, more visible now? I, yeah? Yes, this is better. Thank you. You are very much welcome. Uh, you present new material in small steps uh, and you ask the student to practice after each step. Why? Because according to people who study the, the brain, they, they find that uh, our working memory, when we process information, is small. And it can handle uh, a few bits of information at once. Therefore, this procedure presents an appropriate way for dealing with the limitations of our working memory. We have to ask many questions and check the responses of all students. And most effective teachers, by watching them, they ask students to explain the process they use to answer the question, to make sure they understood it completely. The fourth principle is to provide models. Models here is de defined by people in education uh, as work example, where, where they can help learn to solve problems faster. Therefore, we can uh, help the students uh, who need cognitive support to learn to solve problems 
where the teacher demonstrates how to solve the problem. Uh, therefore, if we do that, we reduce the cognitive load on their working memory. The fifth principle is to guide student practice by sufficient rehearsal. This is very important. Why? Because the, by the end of the day, we train students to, to, uh, to do well with, during independent practice, like during seat work or, or homework activities. The sixth principle is to check for student understanding. Uh, at each point, and this helps the students to learn material, material with fewer errors. These checks provide some of the processing needed to move new learning into long-term memory, which is another word I like. Another very important thing is misconceptions. And you can find this very common. I, I, I used to ask my students about things, and I find that they have a lot of misconceptions that I have to rectify. The seventh principle is to obtain a high success rate. Why? Because uh, high success rate, making sure that all students understand, make them work problems on their own. And mastery learning is, as mentioned before, lessons are organized into short units and all students master one lesson before going to the next. Therefore, tutoring, and I love that, which has to do with social learning, that students can be tutored by other students or by the teacher themselves to help students master each unit. The eighth principle is to use scaffolds. I am a civil engineer and scaffold is something different. But what they, they mean by scaffold here is just a, a temporary support to assist the student when they learn difficult tasks. Therefore, uh, these education people, they, they made me learn new things. Providing scaffold is a, is a form of guided practice. Uh, the ninth principle is require and monitor independent practice. Why? Because uh, this independent practice by students working alone and practicing new material will help them with overlearning to become an auto, uh, to become fluent and automatic in a skill. When, when students become automatic, they can devote more of their attention to comprehensive uh, comprehension and application. The last principle is to engage students in a weekly or monthly review. And here also I like the word interconnections, something very important in learning where the students uh, need extensive practice to develop well-connected networks of ideas that they, the educators call it schemas in their long-term memory. The more one research, uh, one rehearses and reviews information, the stronger this inter interconnection becomes. Uh, I hope I'm still within my time limitation. This is my concluding slide and, and, and where during these 10 minutes, I was able to uh, summarize 10 principles extracted from research in three important areas related to cognitive science, watching master teachers, and uh, the, uh, the cognitive supports or the scaffolds to help students learn complex tasks. Dr. Khatam, yeah, did I abide with the 10 minutes or did I go beyond my limit? No, no, this is perfect. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, um, can we open the floor for questions? Look like a couple of questions before we start the next uh, presentation. Um, any questions? If you don't have, I have one. Yes. Okay, let, yeah. me start. let me yes. start with mine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Professor Ali, do you think uh, all of these principles is applicable for online applications? And especially, uh, which one, if you uh, prioritize it, uh, which one will be, has more priority to start with if we are going to teach online in uh, the fall? Okay. Actually, these are generic ideas, not necessarily suitable for online learning. But what I, I like to say that teachers have different traits. They are different personalities with different backgrounds and they teach differently. But this can be very good uh, principle they can choose from, maybe uh, 
put more principles or, or even change some of the principles to, to suit their own. Every teacher has a comfort zone. He has to be like use tools that he like and he masters but I find them very good advices. I myself, teaching for the last more than 40 years, I benefited from the beautiful article. Okay, thanks a lot. And which one, uh, which principle uh, suits you more? I like this tutoring a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay. Because when I was a student long time ago in Canada, my supervisor used to sit close to me doing real tutoring that I benefited a lot from. I sit close to my students because I, I, uh, I like to, 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 uh, to show them that I will do the same things that were done with me 40 years ago. Okay, thanks a lot, Professor Ali. Any questions? Yes, can you elaborate a little bit on the concept of scaffold because I really didn't understand what it stands for. Maybe you can give an example or something like that. All right. Actually, when students study difficult stuff, therefore, the formal instruction may not be enough. Therefore, you give extra help to, to, uh, to make the student understand the difficult task. Scaffold here, as I, under, I, as I, uh, I understand it, is some, some structure to, to help students sub, be, be supported. Therefore, it's an, an, uh, a support of different kinds, uh, different from the usual instruction, to help students uh, overcome the difficulty of some complex parts of, 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 the, of the instruction, yes. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, let us start with the next presentation. So the next presentation will be uh, from uh, Mansoura University. Um, Dr. Osama Mehlet is an assistant professor at the Mechanical Power Engineering Department. Um, he uh, obtained his uh, PhD from University of uh, Liverpool in 2019. Uh, I give you the floor, uh, Dr. Osama. If you can share your presentation, please. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, go ahead. And please uh, try to manage your time within 10 sure. minutes. For sure. um, thank you very much um, for giving me this opportunity. It's a, a, a pleasure for me to present today. Um, um, I will talk about the research-based teaching and learning practices after um, the COVID-19. Um, the outline of my presentation, I give a brief introduction about experiential learning, levels of learning, and uh, co constructive alignment, um, remote teaching principles and formats, two-way active learning, synchronous and asynchronous learning, what are the pros and cons, and um, uh, the implementation uh, merits and demerits at the end. Um, at the beginning, um, uh, the, uh, the learning style that is suitable with engineering student is the experiential learning. So the, the, the students start by doing or, or the experiment or having a certain experience, participating in a many project, for example. And then after this, he uh, review what have been observed and noted. And this is the reflection or the reflecting process. Um, uh, after the reflecting, he started building uh, conclusion and uh, generate uh, and think about the theory, generate the patterns and uh, drive the understanding of the topic. Um, once he has this conclusion or uh, the conceptualization, uh, he will, will be active um, um, for the next stage to, to plan what's the next step and apply what he has, what he has learned. Um, and, and before the pandemic, the, our, our level of learning, um, we, we, we are trying to exploit this pandemic and the situation we are in to increase the level of learning of our students. According to Bloom's taxonomy, the revised one, uh, maybe our students um, cover the, the low order of thinking skills. So we are trying to make use of our current situation to increase the thinking skills to the higher uh, order and emphasize on the analyzing and the evaluation and, and um, the creativity of, of our students. Uh, uh, doing, um, uh, achieving this would be by 
the modern teaching styles and um, the uh, thinking about the constructive alignment, which is the next uh, the next concept. What is the constructive alignment? So uh, every course uh, we specify the intended uh, learning outcomes, and these learning outcomes should be aligned, well aligned with the learning activities and assessment and feedback. If we design this process and every uh, side of the triangle uh, connected to each other, um, the all the components like the curriculum, the learning outcomes, the teaching methods and assessment, assessment tasks, if they are aligned to each other, the student will find it difficult to escape without learning properly. So he, we will definitely will learn something if we design this process efficiently. Um, uh, according to um, the teaching principles and the formats in our uh, in the in the modern teaching or the remote teaching, it has to be a remote way. Active learning is not a one-way flow just from the teacher to the student. Um, and this also um, drive us to an important concept, which is the motivation. The student uh, can enjoy the task and the activity, and this is called intrinsic activ um, motivation. Um, the student feels satisfied of the engagement. Um, rather than from just have extrinsic um, motivation or engage to achieve a certain grade or a certain mark or reach an end point or afraid of uh, being uh, um, uh, embarrassed from his colleagues or something, the intrinsic motivation has uh, many advantages. Uh, it it enhances the comprehension, the creativity, cognitive flexibility, the achievement, and the long-term well-being. So we are trying to think when we are designing now in, uh, in, a, in a new stage and designing for our new uh, teaching activities um, in the next semester, we are trying to make use of these teaching or research-based uh, learning activities to, to uh, make this constructive alignment. Uh, what has been applied uh, in Montessori University the last semester, recorded lectures, experiments, and tutorials, question banks for every uh, course, video assignment, um, a certain task or in the project, the students film a video and then submit it to the project supervisor, um, regular formative assessment. So if I want to, to gauge the student understanding, I put a quiz, it's not graded, it doesn't affect the final mark of the course, but it gives me an idea if the students are on track or not. Um, group presentations for many projects, teamwork and capstone projects, all these have been applied in the last semester. We are planning to, uh, to apply um, a new uh, techniques uh, to improve the active learning, uh, discussion-based uh, Zoom classes and uh, do the flipped class thing to, and improve the student peer review. Um, also, the discussion um, will be improved by a specific weekly office hours from the professors and the teaching assistants to answer, to answer any questions. Uh, virtual labs, uh, moving to modern CAD software, uh, replacing um, many of the paper uh, submissions, and uh, do the student panels and the student peer review. So a certain topic or subject um, I select um, a group of students and they form a panel and they lead the discussion between them, themselves and I'm just observing them. Um, the implementation pros and cons, uh, the difference uh, between synchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, the synchronous happens uh, virtually in real time, so there is active engagement between the instructor or the lecturer and the student. And um, uh, the pros is um, virtual class uh, room engagement, dynamic learning, and instructional depth, but it has some difficulties, technical difficulties, and rigid schedule. So the student has to be uh, at a specific time available uh, with the with the lecturer. The asynchronous learning happens on the student's own schedule. It has some flexibility. The student run on his own pace. Uh, it's affordable. Doesn't cost uh, cost them anything. Uh, but uh, it has a risk of isolation and the risk of apathy. The apathy is the student uh, should be honest with himself because he's responsible for his own his own learning. 
and um, he shouldn't lose motivation of, um, of, of, of this learning process. Um, the last slide, um, the challenges we have faced and we are, we are facing in the, in the summer and the graduation projects, large number of students and um, about 34 projects, uh, only the weekly discussions on Zoom and uh, how to organize and make the schedule for the judging panel, for the moderation and the logistics behind all this. Um, uh, what, what if any, anything happened with the students, internet connections, how to reschedule the, the project and um, replacing any uh, paper submissions. Um, for the summer training as well, it was, um, uh, it was like easy to just cancel it because it doesn't affect the, um, the marks or doesn't, doesn't have any marks. But we insisted on this summer training to provide the best um, as, as we can to our students and uh, provide the recorded lectures uploaded to Moodle. And this will be linked to WebEx. Um, with a small student groups uh, for for the discussions with the um, the training leader, um, a limited number of the students will will be allowed to the lab, distributed over multiple time slots. And um, and, uh, and thank you very much. Um, I finished here and happy to take um, to take any questions. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Rosanna. Okay, it thank was you. very uh, helpful and. Uh, informative uh, presentation. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a special request from uh, Dr. Nabil Sabri uh, to engage Osama, Dr. Osama, sorry, uh, in all of our activities in the curriculum uh, committee, please. <laughs> okay, uh, so I think he has, he has this knowledge and we can gain a lot from uh, his uh, input here. And I think uh, Dan also is happy because we started the presentation by the CDIO uh, concept, okay, maybe the second uh, slide. So I think you pleased everyone here. So in uh, the, the one before, <coughs> okay, the slide before, yeah, this one. So um, um, if I uh, ask somebody, uh, if you have a question, please go, go ahead. If you don't, I still have one uh, clarification for me. So any questions? I wanted to mention, uh, you know, you, you discussed summer training. And mm -hmm. I think it's really important because uh, the, you, you try to make things efficient, but there's only yes. so much you can do. Uh, if you want to teach more, it may take more time. So if you can get into the summer, that's great. Uh, do, you, do you ever face barriers like you know, students expected to be able to work in the summer? Um, we, we have um, uh, in the first year mechanical engineering students, they have to pass uh, certain training hours dur during the summer in, in our um, faculty workshops and, and labs. So um, we, uh, in, the, in the previous years, the students attend uh, and then the groups watch the, um, uh, the operator on a machine or um, it's um, um, like um, um, actual, actual interaction with the, with the workshop um, uh, leader. But at the moment, we, we cannot do this, but we insisted on um, trying to transform this into remote, um, remote uh, methods and uh, put all the things, uh, all the teaching materials on uh, on Moodle, um, and try to to do the Webex or the Zoom meetings for the discussions. If any student have any question, um, also uh, engaging with the virtual labs. If these labs or workshops have been already filmed before, and um, there is a um, um, uh, um, a well well documented source for this, we discuss this with the students. Okay, thanks, Dan. Any questions? Uh, I don't have a question, but just a remark. I'm just using this uh, event to uh, promote an idea. Uh, Dr. Osama, of course, is one of our uh, uh, best newcomers uh, in Mansoura among a group of many persons. You have seen Dr. Asma making a presentation that was considered as a good one. Uh, Dr. Samah, Dr. Ragab. And there is another Usama who will present the next time. 
All these five persons, I'm planning to use them to build the MOOCs. Uh, that uh, uh, there's a large MOOC project that we are planning to conduct. Uh, and I'm just extending the invitation to all professors around this uh, meeting from uh, Ain Shams and from Aswan to join this group in order to prepare online courses uh, in cooperation with MIT for the next uh, semester or semesters. I'm just using this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nabil, for the invitation. And I think you have an excellent resource to start and complete the MOOC program. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Osama. Uh, finally, we, uh, just to make sure that we are within the time limits, we will have our third presentation. It will be delivered by uh, Dr. Ahmad uh, Rashwan. Dr. Ahmad Rashwan is uh, from Aswan University. He received his master's, a bachelor master's and PhD from, or uh, uh, bachelor and master's from Aswan University and PhD from South Valley University. Uh, please, Dr. Ahmed, if you can uh, provide your presentation, slides, please share it. Okay. <clears throat> While he's setting up, is there time for a raised hand from Ingi Jalzam? Uh, Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yes, uh, yes, do, do you hear me? Uh, yes, I do have a question actually addressed to Dr. Osama from uh, Mansoura University. I'm Associate Professor of English Literature at Shams University. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the enlightening uh, presentation. Question for you. Uh, would blended learning uh, fill in the gap between the uh, synchronous and asynchronous type of learning? What do you think? Um, the, the blended, uh, you mean the mix between synchronous and asynchronous? Yes, e-learning and face-to-face -face learning. Yeah, definitely this has advantages and, and disadvantages, every, every type. So if I can take the pros from every type and mix between them, this will, will, will make the most efficient way. Um, because these are the only options we have now, uh, as, as long as we don't have face-to-face -face meetings or, or face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Uh, so we try to uh, mix between them, um, give the students some flexibility in, uh, in recorded lectures and tutorials, but at the same time, it, it has to be in the week, um, at least two or three times in, in uh, uh, interaction in real time with the student. Uh, yes, exactly, because blended learning, as far as we're concerned in Egypt, that would be the future, according to yeah. the Minister of Higher Education, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, by doing this, we can, you know, take the best out of each uh, type of learning yes. approach. That's the yeah. idea. Thank you very much, Professor. You're welcome. Okay, thanks, Dr. Angie. Okay, and, th and thanks for joining us for our uh, um, COVID-19 sessions. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Ahmad, are you ready now? Yes, is my presentation is now sharing. Okay, can you expand the, the screen? Okay, now. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it's it's not clear. I'm not sure if uh, there is a technical problem. Can MIT Group um, share the presentation which I sent early in the morning? Uh, I would just need a, a minute to access it. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Okay. If you want, I can send it to you again. It's okay, it'll just take me a minute. Okay. Um, yes, Professor Walid, I think you'll need to resend it. I can't seem to see it in the inbox. What is the title of the file? I may have it. Okay, uh, I, I can post it from here, I think. Just a second. Yeah, I have it here. I will share it with you. Okay. Okay, 
clear now? Yeah. Yes. If you can just yeah. maximize the screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Yes. Hello, everybody. My presentation is online learning. So this, uh, I can't control. Yes, and the introduction, due to the spread of the coronavirus COVID-19, there will be increasing reliance on online learning for school students. There are some key considerations important to take into account when delivering online instruction. From my perspective, as an educational faculty member, I propose five key consideration for educators to take into account when supporting a student online learning. That's the first key is the instruction. It is important for online instruction to be explicit and well organized as possible, particularly when students are learning a new or difficult subject matter. In the classroom, Teacher can monitor whether students are understand and understanding things and they can adjust instruction as they go. In the classroom, it is easier to deliver information incrementally so students don't get lost and uh, it is easier to provide feedback mm -hmm. in real time. But in the online environment, it is harder to monitor student understanding and there is significant risk that lessons are poorly organized and too much material is delivered too early, leaving the learner lost. So online lesson must be very clear and well instructed. That's my first key in the online uh, learning. The second key uh, uh, is about the content, content of the material. Alongside explicit instruction, the need of high quality content that is appropriate to the learner level, level of knowledge and skill. There is a vast amount of poor quality online information and learning materials. It is thus important that educators first do careful vetting and selection of the online material and the program to ensure that the students are working on the best material possible. In the classroom, if the material is not such good quality, the teacher can see and explain it is vital and provide real-time clarification and one-on-one -on -one help. This is much harder in, in the online environment. The third key here is about motivation. Motivation is here to student energy and the effort as, as they, uh, they learn. There are many parts of motivation. In the online environment, there are vast potential for students to go out to go off the track, try to do some other thing, like some other relevant thing, content, continually monitor and respond to social messaging and emails or uh, uh, gaming, etc. It, In essence, poor impulse control can be a real problem. High quality online instruction and content that keeps the, learn, the learner engaged, engaged and on track can reduce this risk. Frequently reminding the student of this risk is also important. Setting some work that can be printed and completed in hard copy separates the student from the uh, technology for a while and separates them from online competition. A school equals to parents to monitor student online activity can also be helpful. That's about my third key is motivation. My first key is relationships. We are social, creature, interpersonal relations are integral to learning. The classroom in the ideal, uh, is the ideal place where the teacher-student relationships and peer relationships can flourish. The students are pretty good at, cons uh, uh, at connecting with peers online. So here I want to discuss the online teacher-student relationship. In the online environment, it is advisable that teacher maintain contact with the class in numerous ways, such as email, school, online learning platform, video blogs, etc. From a relationship perspective, many opportunity for face-to-face uh, -face online instruction is important. As my last key is uh, talking about mental health. 
Good mental health is not only vital outcome, it is means to other important outcomes, such as learning. If mental, men, mental health suffers, learning usually suffers. When students uh, attend the school in person, teacher and other support staff can observe the student like mental uh, care, uh, health, uh, providing real-time assistance and guide them to provide professional support. This is more difficult to do in the online learning environment. The young bird of online education school will be aware of some students uh, with, who, uh, with whom they must maintain closer contact, including students with additional educational needs. That's all my uh, mental, uh, that's all my key. So in conclusion, online environment over a great educational opportunity during time when it is difficult for students to attend the school in person. At the same time, they can be significant problems to learn if poor quality, uh, uh, if poor, uh, quantity online instruction is delivered. The five considerations presented here provide uh, means by which the school and the teacher can develop and deliver online learning to optimize their student learning. Thank you. This is my last slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for your presentation and thanks for being uh, exactly on time uh, to you, finish your presentation. Okay, um, by finishing uh, Dr. Ahmed's uh, presentation, uh, we completed uh, our uh, insight from uh, the Egyptian universities on uh, the online. Uh, teaching and the COVID-19 impact on it. And I'm not sure if uh, anybody has a question for Dr. Ahmad or can I end this uh, session? Any questions? Okay, so let me end it. Okay, so for myself, uh, uh, when I read Dr. Ahmad's uh, presentation, I am very concerned with the mental part because we didn't uh, look at this uh, side at any of other presentations, and I think it will impact, but let us uh, ask the scientists working on the humanities field to um, like search and give us uh, some feedback regarding this issue. Uh, before I end, I have an open-end question, which is we did a lot of um, teaching, online teaching before, and we did a lot of online teaching during the COVID-19 period, but did we really reach our goal? Did they really learn what we want them to learn? This is an open question, and I don't think that we have an answer for it now. So thanks uh, for uh, this session, presenters, and if we can conclude, uh, Dr. Dan? Yes. Uh... One comment I wanted to make before wrapping up is that it seemed to be a common theme, you know, Dr. Ahmed mentioned it, uh, but others did before him, that motivation is really important. Uh, one of the presenters mentioned both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but, you know, without sufficient motivation, it's hard to really proceed forward. So what can we do? I mean, do... It, it, do we have to provide new motivations or is it sufficient to remind students of the things that caused them to enroll in the first place? They must have had a motivation already. So uh, I, there, I, I think uh, ra raising the awareness um, in the student mind, so um, increasing the importance of what we are doing uh, and if the student is aware that this thing is important for his own learning and for his future, he will be motivated to, um, to engage. So I have a, a, a follow-up. Um, I don't know whether universities in Egypt have decided on the grading format in, uh, in the coming year. So, as you all know, and I think you, you use the same model, which is pass fail uh, or pass no record for the spring that we used. <clears throat> and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about grading in, in the fall and the spring semester next year. 
Uh, I, for one, was for going back to grade system, uh, ABC, like what we usually do here, <clears throat> uh, to make sure that students um, are graded properly and uh, also the students are taking um, the uh, uh, semester as seriously as they would take any other semester. Uh, fortunately, the Institute has decided to go with this model, going back to ABC, uh, but they also decided that nobody will fail. If somebody fails, uh, the record uh, will not show failure in the class. It will just simply delete the class. <clears throat> so those uh, students taking the class will be able to score A or B or C. If they do get a D, then they can either choose to keep it uh, if they need the class for, for graduation, for, 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 for filling the requirements. If not, they can choose to, to totally delete the class. So that reduces the stress a bit, but keeps the quality control that we usually have uh, intact in the sense that um, those who get grades, they will get grades as they get in, in normal classes. <clears throat> so maybe... Um, Someone can tell us a bit more about what the thinking is now in Egypt about giving grades, because I think grades is very much part of the motivation. Okay, if I can uh, give, give a hint and then I leave the floor, of course, to Dr. Dia or Dr. Demer to uh, provide the full information. But actually, uh, Dr. Ahmed, what you are mentioning is exactly what's uh, happening here at the American University in Cairo. Uh, they give them the option of having pass or fail or to be graded if the grade is going to increase their GPA. Uh, for us in the summer, we started with the um, normal marking, but the exam will be online. Okay, so there will be a midterm, final quizzes, assignments, everything reports, but everything will be online. Um, this is what I have up to my uh, level of information, but I think Dr. Dia or Dr. Tamer, Dr. Dia, if you want to, uh, of course, provide the full information, go ahead. Yeah, yeah yes, uh, yes, Olid, you are right. I think we are going back to the normal grading systems, either it's uh, GPA systems or uh, the notes of the students with a percentage in the common courses and so on. So I think we are going back to this system, even in the summer courses, we're going back to this system of grading. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we are in, still in a pandemic and we don't know if there will be some other decisions that may appear suddenly. Uh, but I think even when, when we decided, when the ministry has decided actually to go to the bus fail, they are uh, they were limiting from the beginning this to this uh, semester the spring semesters and for all the odd cases we we were nearly keen to for the students to have the same amount of uh, credit hours with the bus and fail uh, so that uh, by the end of their study we could be able to uh, to make the comparison between the students because this is one of the important uh, requirements later on uh, from the grading system is that uh, we would like to classify the students and having them in order for so many uh, consequences of that, like the selection for the staff members at the university and things like that. It's, it's very important to keep the grading systems uh, effective and, uh, and fair enough between the students. So for the student, for, for the moment, the, the information we have is that we go back to the grading system, independent of the teaching methodology itself. For the teaching methodology, the decision till now is that the next fall uh, will be a hybrid system in which we will have some courses given online, other courses that are uh, given in the classroom with the normal teaching uh, opportunities. And we believe that, we think that all the practical courses will be uh, in the lab. Uh, most of the courses that uh, requires a low density of students or low number of students per classroom, like in years in the elective courses, things like that, it will be uh, in the classroom. And uh, maybe uh, the 
courses with large numbers uh, will be transformed partially at least to uh, some online online courses uh, yes uh, this answer i have for the moment yes do you, you want to say something Nabil? yes uh, uh, all this dis discussion started by dr ahmed ghanem is about the extrinsic part of motivation which is very important i'm sure i mean when a student knows that he can only fail or pass he, he loses interest that's for sure but this is the only, not uh, not the only one, as uh, uh, Dr. Osama said, we have also the intrinsic part, which is engaging the student in the learning process. That he feels that he's not only a, a, a negative uh, uh, recipient, he is also adding, he's also doing something. Uh, I have tried this and it works very, very well, by the way. I would ask uh, students by small groups, each one to prepare a lecture, or half a lecture in fact, about one part of the course. The student for, uh, for half an hour feels that he's a professor and he is instructing his uh, colleagues. And uh, believe me, it's, it's highly motivating. He feels that he's part of the learning process. And of course, making projects is also very, very highly motivating. Uh, these are the two actions that, uh, or the two uh, uh, other forms of motivation that uh, that will uh, uh, profit uh, students. Uh, some students, in fact, by the way, do most of students do care about the grade, but some of them do not, by the way. But they do care a lot about making a project, making something that works. Uh, all kinds of motivation has to be has to be uh, considered. Yes, and making also some things that could be a differentiator for him, even if he yes. doesn't have the grades. But he needs something that could be a little bit uh, different. Uh, my, my overall comment actually on the online education system, I discussed it maybe with Dr. Mohi in our room, uh, that uh, it could be working well for the information-based education or the information-based uh, study. However, in, in the educational system, we have different levels it's not only the information, it's transfer of information and understanding and all these aspects. This could be managed correctly with the online teaching. But you have also the skills and the attitudes, and it becomes more difficult to enhance the student skills during online. Skills like uh, teamwork, things like that, it's not uh, possible, of course. Uh, uh, and, and analyzing skills, uh, Experimental skills, things like that, are quite difficult to be to be touched and really modified. And attitudes are much more difficult because attitudes, I think, usually are affected by the strong contacts by the instructors, uh, thinking with the instructors in the problems together, uh, how to react to different. Uh, Activity have to be courageous enough to, to discuss the point. So we can try to, to improve them, to affect them through uh, the interaction forums. But my impression, my gut feeling is that it's still weak. It's, it's weak. Our, our effect on this level uh, of uh, parameters in the educational system, which is uh, the attitude of the student itself uh, is, is quite weak. <clears throat> Could be very good on the information, a little bit weaker on the skills and much weaker on the, on the attitude. And this is what's uh, concerning, what's, what's dangerous actually. I hope we can find the formula for the online teaching uh, learning on which we can really have strong effect also on the attitude and the skills of the students. Maybe with the mica we can improve the skills a little bit. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, philosophically, I think the answer, at least in my mind, is that once COVID is over, we will probably go back to our old ways uh, because people very much like to be together and very much like to <clears throat> have face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. And as much as we're trying very hard to use uh, this medium that we're using now, 
to communicate and interact, <clears throat> we still feel that um, uh, there's a lot missing. So <clears throat> if, we, if we take it from um, sort of the experience we have in outside teaching, as soon as, as soon as many states around the US started opening the economy, people rushed back and went to restaurants and bars and beaches and shopping malls and <clears throat> wanted to go back to their old ways despite the risk and uh, despite paying a price for it. So <clears throat> I might, you know, my, my humble opinion is that we will probably, as soon as this whole COVID thing is controlled and managed, we'll probably go back largely, largely to the old effective ways of doing things. But <clears throat> this is always a chance to learn few new things and to complement our, our normal modes of doing things by uh, using this medium. <clears throat> and hopefully some of what we're learning now will stay with us as just an extra tool <clears throat> and an extra uh, 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 you know, modality in, in the toolbox we have to communicate. Yeah. I have just one more comment uh, because of the um, you know, mental and psychological well-being of the students was mentioned. <clears throat> um, and that's certainly one major concern and major um, issue that, <clears throat> that we're dealing with. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, telemedicine and online uh, sessions for people who need it are also available, uh, again, to, to uh, respond to some of the uh, issues that the students run into being lonely and being alone and <clears throat> not being able to communicate with their peers, um, that, that there is, there is there's a way of, of reaching them through online um, uh, uh, models. Um, but but I'm, this is really a question to you. We have a couple of hands raised. I think it was Mohi who got in first and then Nabil. Okay, uh, maybe if we think about what happened in COVID-19 and uh, if we think ever about what the students missing during this period of time and did we think about how do we compensate before they graduate? I mean, did anyone think about plan for this? I mean, how much students they lost during this period? Are we going to compensate for that? Or we just move on like uh, Dr. Ghanem said that we go back to the old system and then we go back to the normal teaching. But what happened to the uh, lesson learned from the maybe one and a half year or something like that because we expecting to have a fall in the same mode and maybe the spring as well. So students, they will use a lot during one and a half year of their education. So did we think about something to compensate for those students? Actually for uh, the students, they didn't lose any um, deliverable information. So the, they gained the same information because we provided the same topics uh, even we provided the PowerPoints. Some of the professors, they did don't provide PowerPoints and they talk in the lecture. So in this case, all everything or every information is documented. So they moved from the board into the PowerPoint and the, from PowerPoint to um, recorded lectures. So the students have the same information or even we can say they have more information to work with. But it's not about information only. The interaction but with the still, human. Yes. Yeah. The interaction, they are missing a lot of the interaction. Okay, so this is exactly what happened when we stopped for one week or struggled for one week 
uh, in March. And then when we started the Zoom sessions, the students, they don't want to, at that time, they didn't want to start the lecture. They <laughs> want to discuss and uh, negotiate and uh, like doing a normal human behavior interaction. And after some time, I spent three hours in, of course, I had the Zoom session, which ends in uh, every 40 minutes. So I spent almost four or five sessions, just discussion. And we ended this day with, okay, we, next day we will start with the coming session. We will start the lecture. Okay, and I found it very effective for them and for me as well. Because I'm not saying I'm missing the students, but uh, now I feel there is a gap between me and the students. And through this interaction, I felt that, okay, we are on the same track again and let us start. But I didn't feel that it's normal starting a procedure. We are forced to do it. And as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, we will go back to our uh, nature before Corona, but still we have this point, which is the go online or there is an a desire to go online just in case for any future problems we have to make a plan b for the future how about the field trips and something like that these are the skills that we will miss definitely yes, of course, we, of course. We, are we, are missing, we are missing this part but actually uh, we started our uh, online training uh, for the summer uh, training uh, with the Schneider and uh, Schneider, for example, they provided us with some of their platforms to work on. So at least we are not missing a lot of the information. Again, we are missing the human interaction and to, to have a clear discussion. And some of the students are shy and they want to discuss it one to one. And we are missing this part. So they are providing or they are asking us on our WhatsApp. Uh, privately, which consumes a lot of time. And this is exactly what we are actually missing. What I'm thinking of, Dr. Walid, that actually that maybe the university or the faculty can arrange some kind of afterwards, some open activity so the students can enter this without being related to the course. Like if they are missing a power plant to visit, they, in the there will be maybe more than one power plant field trip during the semester so everyone can enroll and can go there. If they are missing yes. some other activities like this, so it will be something open for the students, not related to courses. So they, they can gain what they have missed during the last one and a half year or so. Yes, Dr. Mohi, some of the courses, uh, they prepared a list of videos on YouTube, okay? like uh, pictures and videos inside a power plant, inside, uh, the, inside a certain factory, a, pro a process uh, of implementation or of manufacturing. So all of these items, uh, they provide it through uh, YouTube videos, okay, and it's available for students. But actually, uh, if you remember, and if Dan remembers uh, as well, uh, do you remember then when we talked about the CDIO uh, implementation and what would be the case if we try to have simulation? Okay, so this simulation will act as part of online, but it takes into consideration the human reaction. So yeah. if we can have this uh, CDIO implementation through simulation, it will help us as well during this uh, period not to lose all of the practical um, skills yeah so it might help but definitely we are missing something here yeah. that's all for me dr Murphy. <laughs> thank you very much dr Williams. No so dr ben Okay, well, I think we're coming very close to the end of our allotted time. So let me thank you all again for your active participation. You know, I think that uh, we've talked a lot about how we can adapt and do the best we can. And we're all eager to get back more nearly to normal, but hopefully we'll 
take with us many lessons that we can use in the future. One last session is coming up on Monday, 27 July, to talk about reopening, bringing people back to campus and the challenges related to, you know, temperatures and COVID testing and spacing and masks and um, much, much to be dealt with. And I hope you'll register for that. And I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.